All right, hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Josh McDaniel and I work with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. And in a few moments we'll start the webinar, but first I want to make a few quick notes. Uh, the first note is that this is a regular webinar series that's sponsored by, uh, in most cases, three organizations, the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, the International Association of Wildland Fire, and the Joint Fire Science Program. The webinar today is also co-sponsored by the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. Um, so uh, in, in honor of that, I want to invite you to visit the Northwest Fire Science Consortium's website at www.nwfirescience.org and check out the searchable library, events calendar, and participate in the online discussion forums. Um, the website provides a one-stop shop for most of the current and emerging fire science in Washington and Oregon. And also, as I mentioned, this is a regular webinar series. We have usually one or sometimes two webinars a month. The next one coming up is going to be uh, presented by Carolyn Sieg of the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And Carolyn has been working with a group of colleagues on a, um, a new fire behavior simulation model looking at fire behavior in beetle kill. Uh, and that'll be on April 4th at 1 p.m. Mountain. You can register for that one and find links to all the recordings of the, today's webinar and other webinars at Advances in Fire Practice. And I put a link up there. You can also Google that and get to it. Okay, so I'll introduce the speaker in just a second, but I just want to first tell you about questions. So the way we do questions is you can type in the questions in the questions or chat box, depending on what it is on your control panel. And then at the end of the presentation, we will uh, work our way through the questions as we can. So you, know, you want to get your questions in early so they're at the top of the queue and uh, so we can get to them. So as questions come to you during the presentation, go ahead and type them in, but we'll, we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. Also, the webinar is being recorded, and it's archived on the Wild and Fire Lessons Learn Center's YouTube channel, and we'll have that uploaded ooh, about an hour, hour and a half after the webinar, and you can either just go straight to the, the Lessons Learn Center's YouTube channel, or there will be a link on Advances in Fire Practice. Okay, so on to today. Uh, Cassandra Mosley is going to be presenting today, and Cassandra is the director of the Ecosystem Workforce Program and the Institute for a Sustainable Environment at the University of Oregon. With the EWP, or the Ecosystem Workforce Program, uh, Cassandra has developed applied research and policy education programs focused on community-based forestry, federal forest management, and sustainable rural development. She's co-editor of People, Fire, and Forests, a synthesis of wildfire social science, and is co-author of Collaborative Environmental Management, What Roles for Government? And with that, I will turn it over to Cassandra. Huh. All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, really exciting to be here today. Um, I wanted to talk with you about our research project that was funded by the Joint Fire Sciences Program around the local economic effects of large wildfires, particularly focused on rural communities. Um, this, this project came about through a couple of different uh, routes. One is um, realizing or knowing that uh, there's been a lot of uh, work done on natural hazards and the impacts of natural hazards on communities. Um, and so we want, but, but very little done on wildfire impacts. And then also knowing that there is a, if we just think about fires from a, from a applied point of view, there's, the, you, we sort of, we, the media, right, spends a lot of time talking, you know, ta discussing, um, you know, burning houses and evacuations, but we don't really hear that much about sort of the more subtle things that go on in communities when, when a fire comes to town. And so we wanted to get a handle on those things. I worked on this project with a pretty big team of folks, um, a number of people at the University of Oregon. You, you can see here as well as collaborators from the Forest Service Research, Research and Development. Pam Jakes recently retired from the Northern Research Station and Krista Gebert who started, when we started this project was at the Rocky Mountain Station and she's now with uh, the, um, the the regional office in, the, in but didn't have to only had to move down the hall. So those folks have been really key key in this project. And so what we wanted to what, as we thought about this project, we wondered um, or we think about uh, you know local economies and local communities and, and the, maybe the most obvious impacts are the negative ones. The tourism you know the tourists who may not come, the natural resources, the loggers not able to go into the woods. Um, 
in maybe in the service sector, people leaving, visitors can't can't visit. You know, you if you're evacuated, you probably don't go to work that day. Um, yet, on the other side, um, the Forest Service and the other federal land management and state agencies that have uh, fire suppression or management obligations spend a lot of money when a fire comes, and so maybe those things. Um, outweigh the negative impacts to a local economy, and we didn't know the answer to that. And so, but you know, federal employees potentially have overtime and hazard pay. Contractors show up, lodging. People are staying maybe in hotels. How does this uh, all play out? And so, we really focus on on three uh, research questions. Um, and luckily, I think hopefully we're not going to. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the methods that we use to get to our results, and hopefully jump to the chase. On, on the results side. So our questions were, um, how do large fires affect the local labor markets in, 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 or labor markets in local communities? So we're looking at the employment and, and wages impacts. We didn't look at the structures burned or the, you know, the, the amount of standing timber loss or anything like that. We were really focused on the employment and wages. And then we wondered, how does local suppression spending influence that, those labor market impacts? And then finally, um, because it became clear that one of the key factors was how much, uh, and just to flip over one card early on here, how much of the suppression spending was spent locally was a, is a really key feature. We really wondered and started to dig into the question of what influences a, a local community's ability to capture suppression spending. So I'm going to take you through these three questions um, and hopefully with enough time that we have some, some substantial Q&A at the end. Um, because I think that this, this study raises as many questions as it answers. <coughs> to get at these three questions, we looked at large fires in the western United States that the, uh, occurred between 2004 and 2008, where the Forest Service was the lead agency and um, the fire cost more than a million dollars. Um, so large, we, we chose large fires. Um, some of them was are gigantic and some of them are just large. Um, we examined county wages and employment during and after fires, comparing counties that had fires and counties that didn't have large fires. And then we used a sample of, a smaller sample of fires, 135, where we look at the suppression spending. And from that, we, were, we got that suppression spending information um, by looking at the transaction by transaction, credit card swipe by paycheck, uh, look at uh, Forest Service spending on these 135 fires, which is no small amount of data. data. And we look at, uh, also on those 135 fires, how much local business capacity and how, con how the economies are structured to understand what, uh, what's driving local uh, suppression spending. So you can see in this graph, these are the fires we looked at. The um, red one, the ones in the the black ones and the red ones together are the big big set of fires we looked at, and the red ones were the ones where we had these detailed fire suppression spending data that allowed us to look in more detail at how suppression spending impacted uh, the communities. So the big take home message is that um, during a fire, um, wages and employment tend to increase. Um, Employment, we found about a, a percentage to percentage a half uh, on average employment increase during the fire. And that counties um, where, uh, that counties that tend to have government dependent economies, that is whether it's the gov government, federal, state, and local government are the primary or the largest employers um, and places where there's a lot of frequent fire tend to see the larger increases or bumps during the, during the fire. Um, uh, so, um, you start to see, you know, you know, one percent feels like a small number, but think about one percent in 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 proportion to something like the unemployment rate, or the difference between seven percent and eight percent unemployment, or ten percent and eleven percent is actually a pretty big number. We're talking about employment, which isn't scaled exactly the same way, but it, it's it's in these kinds of um, numbers, you know, a percentage of employment is a is a is a reasonably is a, is a reasonable number. So. Okay, so what affects local spending? Um, what we learned, so if we know that the employment um, goes up, what we learned also is that the, 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 large, the size of the fire um, increases. Oh, you know, I'm going to skip the slide and come back to it. My apologies. So the, one of the big things we learned, though, is that you see uh, that, this, that, this, um, fi that this fire um, that fires don't just have an impact while the fire is occurring. And you can see on this graph that the point zero 
um, is the is you can see this bump in wages and employment. But then the strange thing happens: the fires increase, the wages and employment increases during the fire, but then it decreases after the fire even more than you would have expected. So if you get rid of this, you, if you smooth out the the normal bumps and ups and downs in the economy, what you see is that during a fire, the, wage, the wages and employment go up, and then they, they drop down below what you would have expected. And then the, about a year after the fire, four quarters after the fire, they bump back up again. And they, they increase this, this volatility um, for about five quarters after the fire. So fire just doesn't affect the community at, at, the, at the moment of the fire, but also afterwards. And so what we learned about wildfires and volatility is that Wildfires tend to occur in places that are already have greater than seasonal average volatility, and that that is these these communities uh, where large fires happen tend to be communities with highly highly seasonal employment. Even after you control for that, you see that while the wildfires create this instability that lasts for a while, so that those communities um, tend to have greater economic instability. And instability in an economy is it's a tricky thing because it, it, it tends to make people rather risk, risk averse and unlikely to invest. And so what you're seeing in, in potentially in these communities is that uh, they see these bumps during the fire, but you see this instability, which could have larger ramifications for these communities over time. So um, one of the key things we learned, let me return back now here, is that um, local spending greatly increases uh, the the um, impact of these fires, and so that the 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 size of the fire, the overall size of the fire, isn't driving those the that increase in in unemployment employment during the fire so much as the amount of money that's spent locally. So for every um, million dollars that is spent in a county of a fire, you see about another one percent increase in the in the wages, um, or excuse me, in the employment during that fire. Now it's not a linear. Uh, arrangement so you get a hundred million fire if you hundred million dollars you don't have this gigantic in, in, in increase but you can see that this local spending piece is, is really the key key factor that's influencing the size of that upward bump during during a fire sorry while well, my screen my computer catches up with me here bunch of you on the up with Josh do you have any suggestions here oh here we go we're back we're, we're moving again so if that local spending spending matters um, what influences uh, whether or not a community um, captures that fire suppression spending um, and that was the third question that we really tried to get a handle on and one of the things as we started to look at this was that there's a really wide variation in local capture um, of fire suppression spending. And by local capture, we mean that the money from the fire is spent on paychecks, credit card swipes, um, and contractors who are located in the same county where the fire occurred. And money, when somebody shows up but they live somewhere else, that does not count as local spending. So uh, what we found is that if we look at the whole array of, of, of suppression spending between zero and 39% of any given fire of these large fires was spent in the county where the fire occurred, which with an average about 9%. So there's a lot of variability. It's generally in this low zero to 5%. Um, but what we really wanted to do is get a handle on why these numbers vary. It turns out that to really do this, we needed to focus in on suppression contracting. And suppression contracting in our sample was about 39% of the total suppression costs, greater than the cost of federal personnel spending and agreements with state agencies. So we looked at the contracted services in, in the data around suppression. These are called other contractual services. We excluded the fire contracts, which we the flying contracts, which we figured were highly concentrated and there was not much you could do to affect um, that. And we asked, and you, so if you think about those suppression contracting, these are um, obviously choices the agencies can make about who, who gets this work. Um, those choices are structured by a lot of complex things, which I'm hoping you guys will tell me about at the end of this, um, at the end of this, uh, my presentation. But uh, 
or future and future dialogue. So if you think about suppression co contracted services, there's the direct, the, maybe the obvious ones, the fire crews, the engines, the tenders, that kind of stuff. And then there's the support services, the food catering, the medical, the base camp, all those things. And so we're looking at both of those, those together um, in, in this remainder of this project. And so what you can see, first of all, is there's a lot of variation in, um, in uh, local capture of suppression spending, ranging from none to 60%. It captured locally and a little bit higher than overall. We have about 12% contracted captured on average. And those, um, those, this map is of the maps of the very individual fires for, for which we have these data. And you can see the light green is the sort of the representation of the whole cost of the fire, of the, of the suppression the whole amount that they contracted out, and then the dark green is the percentage of that that went to contractors located in that, given the county where that fire occurs. So if you think a minute, this is a map of where the money flows from all those fires. So if you imagine the white dots here are all the individual fires we looked at, and you threw all that money into a pot, and you looked at where it flowed to where the contractors are located you can see where the money is flowing from these fires. So, you know, if you imagine the fire in Idaho, I mean, excuse me, in, in the middle of Utah, you can see it's in a dark green area, which suggests that the, uh, not very much money is being spent in that local area. And the red is where lots of money from all these fires taken together is flowing. And so you can see a pretty strong uh, geographic uh, distribution of the capture, where Oregon and Northern California play a pretty big role in fire suppression uh, contracting, um, and that's where they're capturing a lot of the spending from these fires. So what influences this pattern, or, or what we really, look, we didn't look at what influences this overall pattern, but what makes it likely for a community to be able to participate. And over the years, we've done a, a fair amount of work um, trying to understand uh, when local communities are able to capture um, forest and watershed restoration contracts. And you know, what we've learned through that work is that a lot of things like um, you know, your proximity to an urban area and the kind of work you're doing and, uh, the, um, and, and there's a number of sort of factors that are about your community that tend to drive this. And when we've given these talks about the local capture of restoration activities, people always say, but is this caused by there's no businesses in the community or there are, and there, or there are businesses, but they're being outcompeted. So we tried to take a somewhat different angle here, and we wanted to understand what the role of, of businesses in communities prior to fires, uh, how they influence what happens when the fire comes. Now, we know from both the, the, from that map and also from the natural resource work we've done, natural resource and restoration work we've done, that businesses who do this kind of work move around a lot. And so if you think about, um, you know, before a fire, um, there's a, there are businesses who participate in fires, either the, the last fire in their community or in other places. And similarly, people um, participating in natural resource management activities uh, may well be participating not only in their local community but elsewhere. And so we looked, um, we looked at a different data set than the fire data sets in something called the Federal Procurement Data System, uh, which is where the federal agencies record all the contracts for uh, all the federal contracts to do all kinds of things, um, and so we looked for those that do do work that's correlated with fire acti with fire 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 events and activities that are related to natural resource management. And what we essentially found is that counties with more federal and natural resource vendors prior to a fire capture a greater percentage of the money when the fire comes, and that the more diverse the economy is, the more likely they're to capture money. And so. Um, what you, let me just play this out with a few numbers. So if you're a, a county that before fires has five, so five or so um, uh, um, fire-related uh, vendors in your county doing work, doing any kind of work that they're doing, um, and then you have a sort of average fire, that will um, that suggests that you'll get about five percent of the of the uh, of the um, suppression spending will be spent locally. And if you go to 38, which is about the average, you get about 8% locally. And then you get to really high numbers, 96 contractors, you get about 17. And then if you look at this, this the bottom graph here, what you see is that um, counties that are 
unspecialized, that is diversified account, uh, counties, are the ones that tend to have this bigger increase in local capture rates over counties that are more specialized. So being government specialized tends to help you a little bit um, compared, to the, compared to the mean. So one of the things you see, uh, just to start to bring this to conclusion, is that um, large fires increases local employment during fires but fires are more likely to happen in places with large seasonal swings in employment. And so this, and this volatility in, 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 in employment increases over the years following the fire. Um, and then the second thing this says, is, suggests is that, that, that large fires um, do, yeah, as I said, large fires increase local employment, but um, the thing that the key to increasing local employment is really the capture of suppression uh, spending. And the more renders you have before a fire, the larger you have, the more likely you are to capture that. But one of the challenges is that having a lot of vendors doesn't guarantee that you'll have a lot of local capture as the number of vendors go up. You definitely need to have vendors, but if you don't have, if you do have them, there's no guarantee that you will. Um, you can see that in the it, when you start to dig really in deeply into the data, this becomes obvious. And so one of the things that's interesting about this is you have the suppression spending creating these bumps in employment. But you also have communities that are, the communities in which these uh, fires are occurring tend to be more vulnerable, have more vulnerable economies from the get-go. And that the way you sort of make these fires uh, to be uh, less dramatic are to uh, have more vendors, but the places that tend to have vendors are those more diversified uh, economies, and so you're starting to see potentially this divide between the, new, the impacts on, if you would think of it as the new west, right, the diversified economy, larger economies, and the old west, where you have more labor volatility, less likely to capture uh, the suppression spending. So I think one of the lessons here for me is to, is to think really carefully about um, the likely uneven effects of our suppression system on, on rural communities and what, what, we, what we might want to do with them. So I want to raise in my in, in closing with this a couple of I would say policy questions or implications that I, I'm not suggesting recommendations here, but I think these uh, are questions we want to gra come to grapple with as a community. So if pre-existing capacity um, influences local capture, what is the right amount of local capacity, both to mitigate the economic disruptions of the wildfire and to efficiently deploy resources, suppression resources? Um, and then I think this raises another question, which is how does one create or sustain um, this capacity? What's the role of non-suppression contracting practices in creating local capacity? Because we've, one of the things we discovered is that community's ability to participate in the natural resource economy um, makes them better prepared to be participating in the, in the suppression economy. And then how do the role of uh, suppression contracting and dispatch practices influence capacity? And we didn't talk about it because we didn't look at it, but what's the role of direct federal employment and how does, obviously, direct federal employment also uh, uh, influences the way these labor markets respond. So I think that this study um, really suggests some, that we can be thinking about suppression um, not only or not only as a matter of efficient deployment of resources for the activity of, of, of managing fires, but also for managing the impacts of those fires on rural communities. Um, and obviously there's a lot to be thought about in terms of what's the best, best way for both of those um, and, and not to pick one over the other, but I think this provides food for thought in that era. So thank you and I really welcome um, additional questions or, or dialogue at this point. Okay. Thanks, Cassandra. There was, before we get into questions, there was a couple questions that came to mind, and I, and I might not, and might be my not under, well, let's see, I guess, or is there a way to look at it longitudinally, so to say, over time, there's been, you know, certain, you know, like, what was the time frame you were looking at in terms of how? Yeah, we looked at 2004 to 2008, and we got inter interested in this. Um, and we actually have another project we'll be starting with Joint Fire Science. We're just starting getting started that will address, a, begin to get a handle on a lot of this suppression markets and how, and, and how agency decisions about how they manage contracting markets influences both communities but also their suppression capacity that's available. Um, so we'll, with that process, we'll have some more recent data. We got into this in part because we knew that, you know, in the old days of fire 
um, suppression, the emergency equipment rental agreements were a really common way. You sort of call everybody who was already in the woods and get them to go work on the fire when they were used to be logging or something, and that we knew that that system had radically changed to, you know, the, the regional and national contracts, the, the near end of the ERA contract, and, and suspecting that there had been a move away from um, uh, more localized suppression uh, resources. Um, we don't have a really good way to look very, at least we didn't find a way, and maybe someone here knows about good data that we don't know, but we couldn't find very old data that was quality to compare to this new data, and so that's part of why we've got this narrow window. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. But, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let the other people ask questions, and maybe we'll get in, in, I'll get back to it if we have time at the end. But um, one thing, uh, Cassandra, it seems like your voice kind of goes in and out sometimes, so make sure you're, uh, if you're staying close to the mic, if you can. Okay, thanks. Um, and Mark Stevenson wants to know, in the one year after period for employment, would that include flash flooding or landslide response? Any sort of post? Um, to the extent, uh, that, that's a really good question, and we don't know a ton, we didn't, we weren't able to look a ton at what the details of what those activities are, but I think what this suggests is that post-fire recovery activities like bear, like um, you know, whatever, whatever that is that uh, you do in the year after a fire are continuing to, um, you know, create that sum, basically the following summer bump up in employment and wages. What's a bit of a mystery to us is why in the, in the season, the two quarters after the fire, you take such a big hit. And um, those of you who live, in, live and work in communities that have followed this on the ground, we'd be really interested in some sort of explanation for this because it's, it's not super obvious from just looking at the data. We need to kind of ground truth this with people's experiences and stories. It's more obvious to think about, you know, that the recovery takes a while. Right. Okay. Um, Matt Dickinson writes, it looks like dips in employment come during winter, which would be in sync with expected seasonal patterns. Is that something you noticed? That is true, um, but those dips in employment are after the controlling for the dips in, in the winter. So we, um, the models we built assume, uh, look at the regular dips in employment and by comparing it to other counties' dips and sort of control for that and smooth all that out. And the dips we see are the dips that occur beyond the normal dip. Okay. Uh, Carol Miller wants to know, how do you define the local community for each fire? Was it the closest community to the fire? Um, we defined it to be um, the county where the fire started. Um, that's imperfect for a variety of reasons, you know, like some fires start right on a border and then move into the other county. Um, but the way wages, uh, employment data is operates, it operates the smallest, finest grain you can get employment data is at the county level. So we couldn't go below that. Um, and at the time we started the study, uh, fire perimeter data wasn't widely available to us at least, and so we couldn't do it a different way. But now I think doing it, we might do it differently. But you've got to figure that on average, it's, it's, it's okay as a way to do it probably there are some fires for which our approach was a little bit silly. Okay. Uh, Brandon Katzel wants to know if you can get a copy of the presentation and just I'll just uh, repeat that there's a, the, the webinar is being recorded so there'll be a copy of the video, a video file copy of the webinar on advances in fire practice after the webinar but if you'd like to get a copy of the PowerPoint you can contact Cassandra directly and I believe her email is up there on the screen right now. Okay. Um, Next question is from Matt Dickinson as well. Had, uh, how do full suppression fires differ from fire management fires and local e economic effects? That is a really good question to which I do not know the answer. Yeah, you do. Um, we, yeah, we did not know. We, did, we couldn't distinguish those in our data set um, at the time we had the data, but it's, I think it's an excellent question. Okay. Um, Kevin Barnett wants to know, how do you think local capture of suppression spending for smaller fires would vary from your large fire sample? Um, 
That's a good. That's also a good question, and I don't know the exact answer to it. But I have some. Uh, we have a we prior to um, doing this quantitative uh, study, we did a uh, qualitative case study in Trinity County, California, during after uh, related to the 2008 wildfires, which were very long, four months, and were hugely expensive, and um, had a lot of impacts on the community. Um, and what we heard from there was that the that locals got a lot of the work and work opportunities at the beginning of the fire and at the end of the fire when the type 3 teams were in place and when the type 2 and type 1 teams were in place, the, the, opportun the local opportunities seemed to dry up. And you all may know better than me how standard that practice is, but what it suggested to me is that one of the things I would want to know more about is how the different teams dispatch and choose their resources, and that's going to obviously have a lot of impact. And then, of course, in any given fire or fire season, um, you'll see variability because if a resource has already been called up to go somewhere else when the local fire starts, uh, you know, even if they want to pick you, you're not there. But I think that the, it, what, what I think it's suggesting is that the, 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 type, the, team, the type of team that's in there, and so small fires are likely to have type 3 teams, which would su then suggest that those things are going to be, uh, there's going to be more local resources used and more local, therefore more local capture. Right. Okay. Um, next question is from Jorge Raposo, and uh, hopefully I get this question right. Let's see. It says, I'm interested to know if the costs that are related to large fires for instance, take into account the material costs and the other point of view of how to take into account social costs like jobs, injuries, the impacts of deaths of the people that are dealing with this fire? Um, you know, we did not, we looked, it's, it's definitely the case that we did not look at explicitly um, the uh, the, the non-labor market negative impacts, so injuries, deaths, um, housing, uh, or you know, house uh, structural burn, burning, those sorts of things. We didn't explicitly look at those in this. Um, to the extent that those things were big enough to affect the labor market, we probably saw some of them. What's really interesting, I'll say, I did, we didn't include it in this study, this this webinar, because we're just finishing the analysis of it, but. Most natural hazards, um, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, you don't see a bump during the, the, the story you hear is not the story, which is to say you usually see during the event a decline in, in wages and employment and then increases after as people, the recovery is the main economic engine in these, in these events. Um, and the other thing that you typically see in uh, other hazard events is that the construction industry is the major industry that goes up after a fire. That's not the story of um, of wildfires. I mean, excuse me. The, you usually see construction as a thing that goes up during after a hazard, hazard event. The construction industry, but in wildfires, you don't see that pattern. Construction industries don't don't tend to grow uh, within a, within the county where the fire occurred. So that in the overall economy. Um, it's, this suggests that, the, that um, the natural resources sectors and those kinds of sectors that are more engaged in the suppression and the recovery are the ones that increase, um, whereas the, the construction, which is the, you know, the, the recovery caused by structural losses, are, is a pretty small uh, and infrequent player in, in post-fire recovery. And in fact, they may take hits as people's slow building um, after a large fire. Okay. Um. Mark Stevenson left a comment, so it might be sort of a might be something that um, you can address. But it says black burn trees are not attractive, so recreational areas suffer drops in attendance. So is it could you know part of the explanation be that some of these areas are recreation or tourism dependent for their economies, and you have a big fire that there's a big drop off in people coming into the area to recreate, which could yeah, and we see that when we looked at the sector sectors specifically in the data the analysis we're just finishing up now. Uh, you see that that is the tourism industries and um, it are the industries that take the biggest hits after fires um, during and after um, so that's a, that's a, that that conventional wisdom is proving to be right okay okay so um, one one question I'm trying to 
rephrase my question from the beginning. I guess is you know have you seen you know as we've seen the huge increase in spending on fire over the past decade or so, and then also the you know the increasing size and uh, of fires and burned area of fires. Is there? It seems like you could be able to track that as well in terms of that how all that spending and these longer duration fires would start to have longer impacts. So do you see a change over time in how the fires uh, impact? I got it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get it the first time around. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a good. We didn't we didn't do that, but I think that's exactly a, a really interesting thing to test. Um, do, are to what extent? And we see echoes of this a little bit. To what extent are some places becoming fire, you know, having a little bit of a fire economy, um, yeah. and that they are in the, their their communities are in the fire business in some, in some deep way, whether they're moving around or it's in their local area. Um, so I think we're seeing that emerge, um, and you can see it in that in the map that we showed with the red the red splotches where there's a really concentration of spending. We didn't go and look at over a long period to see if um, the economic effects are increasing over time, but you would expect, I think, that given that suppression spending is increasing and that suppression spending is driving a lot of this, these impacts, that they would be increasing. I think the question would be the rate of increase in ha and it, for any given local community, is the rate of increase are they experiencing any actual, actually any extra money flowing down into those communities, or is it mostly just going to those concentrated areas? So a community may not experience that increased flow if the money is flowing actually not actually flowing to their area, and that's a very open question. You know what the rate of those two lines are, if you will. Right. Right. Okay. Well, this is interesting. Um, well, another question just came in, and it says. Uh, Justin this is from Justin Johnson, and he he wants to know if you if, if there's any way to track amenity migration patterns as a result of large fires. So I guess that sort of w people moving in and out of areas because of fires, you know, is there a drop off in in migration that sort of thing? I think that's what he's asking. Yeah, you know, it, actual migration um, patterns. It's these are so in the hazard natural hazard literature. There's some effort to get a handle on this, and the dilemma of doing this is that migration data is taken very infrequently, and um, you know at, at the sort of at the level of the decennial census, and so it's so grossly uh, calculated that you sort of can see you can see it in Katrina, but there's <laughs> a pretty small chance that you could see that level of migration with the data is available in, in the fires uh, that we are experiencing in the West. They probably aren't big enough given the coarseness of, this, of the data. That said, um, we're working on another project around community wildfire resilience and one of the things we'll be looking at um, is a broader array of um, fire impacts, not just these labor market impacts. And we hope that we'll get a, a look at these migration pieces, but I'm not super helpful it's going to work unless we can honor some data set that we haven't yet found. Because right. people coming and going is a really tricky thing to, to measure. All right, Cassandra, well, that is all the questions we have. So I, I want to thank you. This is really interesting. It's uh, something I've never really thought about. But then as soon as it comes up, it's like, wow, yeah, there's got to be some impacts from all this money flowing <laughs> in these communities. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, for sure. Well, thanks, Cassandra. Appreciate it. And everybody thank else, you. thank you for coming for the webinar. And if you would like to pass a copy of this on to someone you think might be interested, we'll have the link up on Advances in Fire Practice in about an hour. Great. All right, thanks. Thank you, everyone, coming. All right. Bye.